Good evening. Tonight we follow the adventures of Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp. So snuggle under the blankets and rest your head comfortably on your pillow. When you're all settled in, close your eyes. Somewhere in Persia, there once lived a poor tailor who had a son called Aladdin, a careless, lazy boy who would do nothing but play ball all day long in the streets with little lazy boys like himself. This grieved the father, who soon passed away. Yet, in spite of his mother's tears and prayers, Aladdin did not mend his ways. One day, when he was playing in the streets as usual. A stranger asked him his age, and if he was not the son of Mustafa the tailor. "I am, sir," replied Aladdin. "But he died a long while ago." On this, the stranger, who was a famous African magician, bent down and kissed him, saying, "I am your uncle, and I recognized you from your likeness to my brother. Go to your mother and tell her I am coming." Aladdin ran home and told his mother of his newly found uncle. Very much surprised, she said, "Indeed, your father had a brother, but I didn't think he was alive." However, she prepared supper and sent Aladdin to seek his uncle. The magician then arrived bearing gifts of wine and fruit. He took a moment of silence to bow down to the place where Mustafa used to sit. And then went on telling Aladdin's mother not to be surprised at not having seen him before, as he had been out of the country for forty years. Once the greetings were done, he turned to Aladdin, now a young man, and asked him, "What is your trade, son?" The latter hung his head, slightly embarrassed, while his mother burst into tears. The truth was that Aladdin was lazy, and would learn no trade. The magician wanted to encourage Aladdin to make something of himself, and so he offered a solution. I will purchase a shop for you and stock it with merchandise that you can sell, he said. The next day, the magician took Aladdin all over the city, and bought him fine clothes. When the uncle brought him back home at nightfall, his mother was overjoyed to see her son now so well dressed. Then, the following day, the magician led Aladdin into some beautiful gardens a long way outside the city gates. They sat down by a fountain, and he pulled a cake from his bag, which he divided between them. They then journeyed onward. Until they had almost reached the mountains, Aladdin was so tired that he begged to go back, but the magician assured him they didn't have much further to walk, and entertained him with fascinating stories. When they arrived at two mountains divided by a narrow valley, the magician said, "We will go no further now." He asked Aladdin to go gather some wood for a fire, and added, "I will show you something wonderful here." When the fire was lit, the magician threw on it a powder, while at the same time reciting mysterious words. The ground trembled, and the mountain opened in front of them, revealing a secret cave. Aladdin tried to run away. But the magician caught him. Fear nothing, but obey me. Beneath this stone lies a treasure which is to be yours, and no one else may touch it. So do exactly as I tell you. At the word treasure, Aladdin forgot his fears and grasped the ring, as he was told. The stone came up quite easily, and some steps appeared. Go down," said the magician, 
At the foot of those steps, you will find an open door leading into three large halls. Go through them without touching anything, or you will die instantly. These halls lead into a garden of fine fruit trees. Walk until you come to a niche in a terrace where stands a lighted lamp. Pour out the oil it contains and bring it to me. He drew a ring from his finger and gave it to Aladdin, wishing him luck. Aladdin found everything the magician had said, gathered some fruit off the trees, and having retrieved the lamp, arrived at the mouth of the cave. The magician impatiently said, Hurry and give me the lamp. This Aladdin refused to do until he was out of the cave. So the magician flew into a terrible rage, threw more powder onto the fire, yelling the mysterious words, and the cave disappeared into the mountain, leaving Aladdin trapped. The magician fled Persia forever. He was no uncle of Aladdin's, but a cunning magician who had read his magic books of a wonderful lamp, which would make him the most powerful man in the world. Though he alone knew where to find it, he could only receive it from the hand of another. He had picked out the foolish Aladdin for this purpose, intending to get the lamp and leave him trapped in the magical cave afterward. For two days, Aladdin remained in the dark, crying and lamenting. At last, he clasped his hands in prayer, and in doing so, rubbed the ring which the magician had forgotten to take from him. Immediately, an enormous genie rose out of the earth, saying, What is your wish? I am the genie of the ring and will obey you in all things. Aladdin fearlessly replied, Deliver me from this place. On these words, the earth opened, and he found himself outside. As soon as his eyes could bear the light, he went home. He told his mother what had happened, and showed her the lamp and the fruits he had gathered in the garden, which were, in reality, precious stones. He then asked for some food. Alas, she said, I have nothing in the house, but I have spun a little cotton and will go and sell it. Aladdin bade her keep her cotton, for he would sell the lamp instead. As it was very dirty, the mother began to rub it, that it might fetch a higher price. Instantly, a genie appeared and asked what she would have. She fainted in shock, but Aladdin, snatching the lamp, said boldly, Fetch me something to eat. The genie returned with a silver bowl, twelve silver plates containing rich meats, two silver cups, and two bottles of wine. When she came to herself, Aladdin's mother said, From where did this splendid feast come? Aladdin told his mother about the lamp. She begged him to sell it and to have nothing to do with devils. No, said Aladdin. This is the chance of a lifetime, and we will use it. And same for the ring, which I shall always wear on my finger. When they had eaten all that the genie had brought, Aladdin stole the twelve silver plates, one after the other, until none were left. He then called on to the genie, who gave him another set of plates, and thus they lived for many years. One day, Aladdin heard an order from the Sultan, who proclaimed that everyone was to stay at home and close their shutters while the princess, his daughter, went to and from the bath. Aladdin was seized by the desire to see her face, which was very difficult, as she always went veiled. And so, he hid himself behind the door of the bath and peeped through the crevice. The princess lifted her veil as she went in, and looked so beautiful that Aladdin fell in love with her at first sight. He went home so changed 
that his mother was worried. He told her he was so in love with the princess that he could not live without her and was going to ask her hand to her father. His mother, on hearing this, burst out laughing, but Aladdin at last convinced her to go before the sultan and carry his request. She fetched an apkin and laid in it the magic fruit from the enchanted garden, which sparkled and shone like the most beautiful jewels. She took these with her to please the sultan and set out, trusting in the lamp. The Grand Vizier and the Lords of Council had just gone in as she entered the hall and placed herself in front of the Sultan. He, however, took no notice of her. She went every day for a week and stood in the same place. When the Council broke up on the sixth day, the Sultan said to his Vizier, I see a certain woman in the audience chamber every day carrying something in a napkin. Call her next time that I may find out what she wants. The next day, at a sign from the vizier, she went up to the foot of the throne and remained kneeling until the sultan said to her, Rise, good woman, and tell me what you want. She hesitated, so the sultan sent away all but the vizier and bade her to speak frankly, promising to forgive her beforehand for anything she might say. She then told him of her son's love for the princess. I prayed him to forget her, she said, but in vain he begged me to go and ask your majesty for the hand of the princess. Now I pray you to forgive not me alone, but my son Aladdin. The sultan asked her kindly what she had in the napkin, whereupon she unfolded the jewels and presented them. He was amazed and turned to the vizier, saying, What say you? Ought I not to bestow the princess on one who values her at such a high price? The vizier, who wanted her for his own son, begged the sultan to wait three months in the course of which he hoped his son would contrive to make him a richer present. The sultan granted this and told Aladdin's mother that though he consented to the marriage, she must not appear before him again for three months. Aladdin accepted to wait patiently, but after only two months, his mother, who was going into the city to buy oil, found everyone rejoicing and asked what was going on. Do you not know that the son of the Grand Vizier is to marry the Sultan's daughter tonight? was the answer. Breathless, she ran and told Aladdin. He was overwhelmed at first, but he decided to call on the lamp. He rubbed it, and the genie appeared. What is your wish? he said. The sultan has broken his promise to me, and the vizier's son is to marry the princess, said Aladdin. Tonight, bring me the bride and the groom. Your wish is my command, said the genie. Sure enough, at midnight, the genie transported the bed containing the vizier's son and the princess. Take the groom, he said, and put him outside in the cold and return him at dawn. The genie took the vizier's son out of bed, leaving Aladdin with the princess. Fear nothing, Aladdin said to her. You are my wife, promised to me by your unjust father, and no harm shall come to you. The princess was too frightened to speak and spent the most miserable night of her life while Aladdin lay down beside her and slept soundly. At dawn, the genie fetched in the shivering groom, laid him in his place, and transported the bed back to the palace. Back at the palace, the sultan went to wish his daughter good morning. 
the unhappy groom jumped up and hid himself, while the princess would not say a word and was very sorrowful. The sultan sent her mother to her, who said, What has happened? Why will you not speak to your father? The princess sighed deeply and at last told her mother how during the night the bed had been carried into some strange house. Her mother did not believe her in the least and told her she had had a bad dream. The following night, the same thing happened. The morning that followed on the princess's refusal to speak, the sultan threatened to punish her. So she told her father everything. The sultan then told the vizier to ask his son about the strange story. The groom confirmed it was all true, and that, as much as he loved the princess, he'd rather die than go through another such night. The vizier's son wished to be separated from her. At last, his wish was granted, and there was an end to feasting and rejoicing. When the three months were over, Aladdin sent his mother to remind the Sultan of his promise. She stood in the same place as before, and the Sultan, who had forgotten Aladdin, at once remembered him and sent for her. On seeing her poverty, the Sultan felt less inclined than ever to keep his word, and asked his vizier's advice, who counseled him to set so high a value on the princess that no man living could come up to it. The Sultan then turned to Aladdin's mother, saying, Good woman, a Sultan must remember his promises, and I will remember mine, but your son must first send me forty basins of gold and jewels carried by eighty strong men, well dressed. Tell him that I await his answer. The mother of Aladdin bowed low and went home, thinking all was lost. She gave Aladdin the message, adding, He may wait long enough for your answer. Not so long as you think, mother, her son replied. I would do a great deal more than that for the princess. He summoned the genie, and in a few moments, the eighty strong men arrived and filled up the small house and garden. Aladdin made them set out to the palace, two and two, followed by his mother. They were so richly dressed, with such splendid jewels in their girdles, that everyone crowded to see them and their basins of gold on their heads. They entered the palace, and after kneeling before the Sultan, stood in a half-circle around the throne, with their arms crossed, while Aladdin's mother presented them to the Sultan. He hesitated no longer and said, Good woman, return and tell your son that I await him with open arms. She lost no time in telling Aladdin, bidding him to hurry. But Aladdin first called the genie. I want a scented bath, a richly embroidered suit, a horse surpassing the Sultan's and twenty guards to attend to me, he ordered. Besides this, six guards beautifully dressed to wait on my mother, and lastly, ten thousand pieces of gold in ten purses. It was no sooner said than done. Aladdin mounted his horse and passed through the streets, the guards scattering gold as they went. Those who had played with him in his childhood didn't recognize him. He had grown so handsome. When the Sultan saw him, he came down from his throne, embraced him, and led him into a hall where a feast was spread. He intended to marry him to the princess that very day. But Aladdin refused, saying, I must first build a palace fit for her, and took his leave. Once home, he commanded the genie, Build me a palace of the finest marble, set with jasper, a gate, and other precious stones. In the middle, you shall build me a large hall with a dome, its four walls of gold and silver, 
each having six windows, whose lattices, all except one, which is to be left unfinished, must be set with diamonds and rubies. There must be stables and horses and grooms and guards. Go and see about it. The palace was finished by the next day, and the genie showed him all his orders faithfully carried out, even to the laying of a velvet carpet from Aladdin's palace to the Sultan's. Aladdin's mother then dressed herself carefully and went to the palace with her guards, followed by Aladdin. The Sultan sent musicians with trumpets and cymbals to meet them, and the air resounded with music and cheers. Aladdin's mother was taken to the princess, who saluted her and treated her with great honor. At night, the princess said goodbye to her father, and set out on the carpet for Aladdin's palace, with his mother at her side, and followed by the hundred guards. She was charmed at the sight of Aladdin, who ran to receive her. Princess, he said, blame your beauty for my boldness. After the wedding had taken place, Aladdin led her into the hall, where a feast was spread. They dined and danced together until midnight. The next day, Aladdin invited the Sultan to see the palace. On entering the hall, he was wonderstruck by the twenty-four windows encrusted with rubies, diamonds, and emeralds. It is a world's wonder, he gasped. There is only one thing that surprises me. Was it by accident that one window was left unfinished? No, sir, by design. Answered Aladdin, "I wished your Majesty to have the glory of finishing this palace." The Sultan was pleased and sent for the best jewelers in the city. He showed them the unfinished window and ordered them to fit it up like the others. "Sir," replied the jewelers, "we cannot find enough jewels." So the Sultan had his own jewels fetched. Which they soon used, but alas, there was only enough to complete half of the window. Aladdin, knowing that their task was in vain, made them undo their work and carry the jewels back, and the genie finished the window at his command. The Sultan was surprised to receive his jewels again, and visited Aladdin, who showed him the window finished. The Sultan embraced him. The envious vizier, meanwhile, hinting that it was the work of enchantment. Aladdin had won the hearts of the people of Persia by his gentle bearing. He was made captain of the Sultan's armies, and won several battles for him, but remained modest and courteous as before, and lived thus in peace and content for several years. But far away in the Sahara Desert of Africa, the magician remembered Aladdin, and by his magic discovered that Aladdin, instead of perishing miserably in the cave, had escaped and had married a princess with whom he was living in great honor and wealth. He knew that the poor tailor's son could only have accomplished this by the means of the lamp. The magician traveled night and day until he reached the capital of Persia, bent on Aladdin's ruin. As he passed through the town, he heard people talking everywhere about a marvelous palace. "Forgive my ignorance," he asked. "What is this palace you speak of? Have you not heard of Prince Aladdin's palace?" was the reply. It is the greatest wonder of the world. The magician knew that it had been raised by the genie of the lamp, and became mad with rage. He set out to get hold of the lamp, and again, plunge Aladdin into the deepest poverty. Unfortunately, 
Aladdin had gone hunting for eight days, which gave the magician plenty of time. He bought a dozen copper lamps, put them into a basket, and went to the palace, exclaiming, New lamps for old! He was soon followed by a jeering crowd. The princess, sitting in the hall of twenty-four windows, sent a servant to find out what the noise was about. The servant came back laughing. Madam, she said, who can help laughing to see an old fool offering to exchange fine new lamps for old ones? Another servant, hearing this, said, There is an old one on the cornice there which he can have. Now this was the magic lamp which Aladdin had left there as he could not take it out hunting with him. The princess, not knowing its value, laughingly sent the servant to make the exchange. The servant went and said to the magician, Give me a new lamp for this. He snatched it and bade the servant take her choice amid the jeers of the crowd. He quickly took off carrying his lamps out of the city gates and to a lonely place where he remained till nightfall. Then he pulled out the lamp and rubbed it. The genie appeared, and at the magician's command, he carried him, together with the palace and the princess in it, all the way into the Sahara Desert. The next morning, the sultan looked out of the window towards Aladdin's palace and rubbed his eyes. It was gone. He sent for the vizier and asked what had become of the palace. The vizier looked out too and was lost in astonishment. He again put it down to enchantment and this time the sultan believed him. The sultan sent thirty men on horseback to fetch Aladdin in chains. They met him riding home, bound him, and forced him to go with them on foot. The people, however, who loved him, followed armed to see that he came to no harm. Aladdin was carried before the sultan and asked to know what he had done. Liar! said the sultan. Come here! and showed him from the window the place where his palace had stood. Aladdin was so stunned that he could not say a word. Where is your palace and my daughter? demanded the sultan. For the first, I am not so deeply concerned, but my daughter I must have, and you must find her or lose your head. Aladdin begged to be granted forty days to find her, promising that if he failed, he would return and suffer death. His prayer was granted, and he left the sultan's palace. For three days, he wandered about like a madman, asking everyone what had become of his palace, but they only pitied him. At last, he came to the banks of a river and knelt down to say his prayers, ready to throw himself in. In doing so, he rubbed the magic ring he was still wearing. The genie he had seen in the cave appeared and asked him his wish. Save my life, genie, said Aladdin. Bring my palace back. That is not in my power said the genie. I am only the genie of the ring. You must ask the genie of the lamp. Then take me to the palace, said Aladdin, and set me down under my dear wife's window. He at once found himself in the Sahara Desert under the window of the princess and fell asleep out of sheer exhaustion. He was awakened by a hot sandy breeze, and his heart was lighter. He saw plainly that all his misfortunes were owing to the loss of the lamp, and wondered who had robbed him of it. 
That morning, the princess rose earlier than she had done since she had been carried into the desert by the magician, whose company she was forced to endure once a day. However, she treated him so harshly that he dared not live there altogether. As she was dressing, one of her servants looked out and saw Aladdin. The princess ran and opened the window, and at the noise she made, Aladdin looked up. She called to him to come to her, and great was the joy of these lovers at seeing each other again. After he had kissed her, Aladdin said, I beg of you, princess, before we speak of anything else, for your own sake and mine, tell me what has become of an old lamp I left on the cornice in the hall of twenty-four windows when I went hunting. Alas, she said, I am the innocent cause of our sorrows, and told him of the exchange of the lamp. Now I know, said Aladdin. We have the magician to thank for this. Where is the lamp? He carries it about with him, said the princess. I know, for he pulled it out of his vest to show me. He wishes me to break my faith with you and marry him, saying that you were executed on my father's command. He is forever speaking ill of you, but I only reply by my tears. Aladdin comforted her and then left her for a while. He changed clothes with the first person he met in a nearby oasis, and having bought a certain powder, returned to the princess, who let him in by a little side door. Put on your most beautiful dress, he said to her, and receive the magician with smiles, leading him to believe that you have forgotten me. Invite him to dine with you, and say you wish to taste the wine of his country. He will go for some, and while he is gone, I will tell you what to do. She listened carefully to Aladdin, and when he left, she dressed herself beautifully for the first time since she had left Persia. She put on a belt and a headdress of diamonds, and seeing in a glass that she was more beautiful than ever, received the magician, saying, to his great amazement, I have made up my mind that Aladdin is dead, and that all my tears will not bring him back to me. So I am resolved to mourn no more, and have therefore invited you to dine with me. But I am tired of the wines of Persia, and wish to taste those of Africa. The magician flew to his cellar, and the princess put the powder Aladdin had given her in her cup. When he returned, she asked him to drink to her health in the wine of Africa handing him her cup in exchange for his, as a sign she was reconciled to him. Before drinking, the magician praised her beauty, but the princess cut him short, saying, Let us drink first, and you shall say what you will afterward. She set her cup to her lips and kept it there, while the magician drained his and fell back lifeless. The princess then opened the door to Aladdin and flung her arms around his neck. Aladdin took the lamp out of the lifeless magician's vest and ordered the genie to carry the palace and all in it back to Persia. This was done, and the princess and her chamber only felt two little shocks, and in no time she was at home again. The sultan, who was sitting in his closet, mourning his lost daughter, happened to look up and rubbed his eyes, for there stood the palace as before. He hastened there, and Aladdin received him in the hall of the twenty-four windows, with the princess at his side. Aladdin told him what had happened. A ten-day feast was proclaimed, and it seemed as if Aladdin might now live the rest of his life in peace. However, the magician had a younger brother who was even more wicked and cunning and who traveled to Persia to avenge his brother. He knew of a holy woman by the name of Fatima and so he disguised himself as her under layers of veils. He headed to Aladdin's palace 
and all the people, thinking he was the holy woman, gathered around him, kissing his hands and begging his blessing. When he got to the palace, there was such a noise going on around him that the princess bade her servant to look out the window and see what was the matter. The servant said it was the holy woman, curing people of their ailments by her touch, whereupon the princess, who had long desired to meet Fatima, sent for her. On coming to the princess, the magician offered up a prayer for her health and prosperity. When he was done, the princess made him sit by her and begged him to stay with her always. The false Fatima, who wished for nothing better, consented, but kept his veil down for fear of discovery. The princess showed him the hall and asked him what he thought of it. It is truly beautiful, said the false Fatima. In my mind, it wants but one thing. And what is that? said the princess. If only a rock's egg were hung up from the middle of this dome, he said, then it would be the wonder of the world. After this, the princess could think of nothing but to have an egg of the legendary bird, and when Aladdin returned from hunting, he found her in a very bad mood. He begged to know what was amiss, and she told him that all her pleasure in the hall was spoiled for the want of a rock's egg hanging from the dome. If that is all, replied Aladdin, you shall soon be happy. He left her and rubbed the lamp, and when the genie appeared, commanded him to bring a rock's egg. The genie gave such a loud and terrible shriek that the hall shook. Is it not enough that I have done everything for you, but you must command me to bring my master and hang him up in the midst of this dome? This request does not come from you, but from the brother of the African magician whom you destroyed. He is now in your palace, disguised as the holy woman Fatima. It is he who put this wish into your wife's head. Take care of yourself, for he means harm to you and the princess. So Aladdin changed his wish. Instead of a rock's egg, he commanded the genie to make the magician's brother disappear forever, and never to return to Persia. What have you done? said the princess. You have made the holy woman disappear. Not so, replied Aladdin but a wicked magician, and told her of how she had been deceived. After this, Aladdin and his princess lived in peace. He succeeded the Sultan and reigned for many years, leaving behind him a long line of kings. On this note, our story ends. Good night and sweet dreams.